new UFC strawweight champion and for Jessica Andrade I know the Europeans don't like when I use the word winningest right but she is the winningest women's fighter in UFC history no other woman has 11 UFC wins and she puts a capstone uh, uh, on it and on what has been a great career thus far by winning the strawweight title and certainly on a Monday Ken Flo they're talking about the way she did it as she ends Rose Namajunas's reign uh, with a pile drive slam that, that knocked Rose out cold yeah, listen, uh, before we start getting about the, you know, getting into the actual finish, um, you know, listen, it wasn't going too well for her. And, and the fact yeah, that man. she was able to battle back from adversity and show that kind of toughness um, through taking a lot of shots from Rose, Rose Namajunas, I thought was very impressive. Um, she is tough. She is powerful. And, and that ultimately is what got her the win here against Rose now Miyunis. Um, and uh, I thought it was a fantastic fight to start. Uh, one, one of the more excited, uh, one of the more uh, exciting fights, I think, of yeah, the man. night. Um, I thought it was very technical from both fighters. Excellent adaptations uh, from both fighters. And uh, yeah, it was just fantastic. Rose Namajunas looked like an absolute ninja assassin out huh. there. Just looked so sharp. Doing what a very few fighters in the UFC, man or woman, do, period. Uh, the ability to stick and move, get out, utilize her reach forwards and backwards. I was really impressed with Rose Namajunas. This was a sharper Rose Namajunas than we've even seen in the past. Uh, and, and that's as good as she looked against Ioana young Jacek. She was even better here against Andrade. Yeah, I thought those first five minutes, as I said to her in the post-fight interview, uh, that a lot of people are criticizing me for even doing. But I said to her, that was the best five minutes that we've ever seen you and who better to sum it up uh than you so yes i agree it was rose namajunas's fight and i think that's why you know my appetite is for a rematch and obviously i don't want to get ahead of myself because there's a lot to dissect before we get there but it doesn't sound like rose namajunas is coming back anytime soon but for andraj you know certainly not a lifetime achievement award for her i think she's the younger fighter in this equation no she's not so rose is 26 and will be 27 in June. Jessica Andrade is 27 years old. Okay. But this was a fighter, obviously, Kenny Andrade, who had success at Bantamweight. A lot of people expected that once she went down to strawweight, she, she would be a perennial contender type, if not champion. I'm so happy for, for this individual and this person. She is such a good human being, and that she made a lot of money this night, and she's going to make a lot of money in her next title defense, which is just so wonderful. Uh, but if, if our listeners don't know, her nickname, Bate Estaca, uh, translation pile driver right and she got that nickname because she was disqualified for doing that in a jiu-jitsu match what she did on saturday night in the octagon absolutely uh was legal and she deserves credit for it i certainly have my concerns about this going forward because i've always thought this was this was the most dangerous move in mma in terms of you know a fatality or paralysis things like that um but talk us through it ken flow the kimura uh defense if you will everything that sort of encapsulated this slam for andrage and for rose yeah sure thing you know um in regards to the move why it wasn't illegal was because rose namunas had the choice to let go of the submission you know i, I think they deemed it that rose was going for a submission she was in that kimura lock um she had uh you know Andrash in that position she was setting it up so she had the choice to let go it, it wasn't like Andrash picked her up on her own doing uh, and then spiked her on her head it was Rose Namajunas going for a submission she had the ability to let go of it and that's why it wasn't illegal it was a legal move by Andraj. and you know for Rose she has two choices here she could either let go of the Kimura lock, right? She ends up be becoming safe there uh, and, and can't be spiked on her head. Or she should be sitting with her butt down to the floor, either going for a Suma Geishi where she's rolling to her back and kicking her over her head, almost like a sacrifice throw, or just getting to the mat 
um, you know, where she can set up a, a different kind of, of Kimura. But getting your body as low to the pos uh, as low as possible to the mat makes it extremely difficult for that fighter to pick you up and slam you. Right. And I think Rose Namajunas is taking that lackadaisical approach um, in the earlier part of the fight where she did you know almost yes. get slammed there yep. i think you know almost gave her that false sense of security like ah you know this isn't a big deal i loved her calmness there but at the same time you need to know your limits as a human and understand that if you're getting picked up over your head over someone's head that is not a good thing it is something you right. don't want right. to do or get used to doing in training in a fight in self-defense those are just way too dangerous of a setup and way too dangerous of an approach so i i hate saying this kind of thing because andrage obviously did the right thing here as far as the counter but Ro and again i hate saying this because of my um respect and admiration for rose nama yunus sure. rose nama yunus lost the fight in, in that regard she had the ability to let go of this move i don't know if andrage won this fight as much as rose namayunas lost this because yeah. rose was in control she was doing a great job she had the ability to let go of this kimura lock she already experienced what could happen to her earlier in the fight and she didn't adapt and that's what makes it so unfortunate i think what what made a lot of people upset as well we give you 10 takes. You couldn't have summarized your thoughts any better. Nicely done. TJ DeSantis tweeted over the weekend a, uh, a, a what is it, a GIF, Kenny? Is that what they call it? Yes. A GIF? Yes, it's sir. not a GIF. It's a GIF. GIF, right? Yeah. I mean, I am every bit 40. I mean, imagine when we're <laughs> fucking 50. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> TJ tweeted over the weekend a GIF of a slam in mixed martial arts that was illegal. And, I mean, that's hard to watch. TJ what fight was that and uh, and what was it it was the angle that made it illegal i assume yeah it was uh from uh, a pride fc match between bob sap and minotaro noguera and uh noguera shoots in on bob sap's legs sap sprawls and oh. and sap was 350 pounds of just dominant muscle like it, they called him the beast there's no more appropriate nickname for that man and uh, he picks up Noguera and slams him on his head. Now the funny Pile thing is, him. yeah, the funny thing is, it wasn't called as an illegal uh, slam. Why? Because Japan, for the most part. But if yeah. there's any slam that I've ever seen in mixed martial arts history that was clearly targeting, uh, you know, the the spine and neck uh, of someone, it was definitely uh, that one. And uh, yeah, I, I I struggle to really remember a time we've ever seen. Uh, a slam be called, uh, you know, spiking and and have a, a, a foul or a point uh, deducted for it. It just, it very rarely happens in MMA. You know, I, I kind of consider that a little bit more of the modern mixed martial arts era for me because I've been watching it since day one. But that was the first time I've ever been legitimately scared for a fighter watching yeah. a modern mixed martial arts fight. I always use that example of Bob Sapp trying to pile drive the legend Minotauro into the mat head first. I mean, it was frightening. So if that was the first time you were scared in modern day mixed martial arts, would you say that this weekend was the last time or were you not scared this weekend? I, I was desperate. Um, again, not necessarily because of the knockout, but because of the neck, as you mentioned. I mean, that is a, a great way for someone to get seriously injured or paralyzed. Um, and those are the kind of moves that we just have to be extremely careful with as fighters. And again... Uh, it, it, you know, Rose kind of did that to herself in a lot right. of ways, and and that really, really concerned me. And again, uh, I, I've made a million mistakes in mixed martial arts fight. We make mistakes all the time, um, and sometimes you know we, we think we're invincible or, or or not aware of what you know certain people can do to counter our moves. Right. Uh, but that was a a, a tremendous lesson, not only for Rose Naminos, but for every mixed martial arts uh, fighter out there who likes going for Kimuras to counter takedowns. What's scary, and and it's scary for fighters like Jessica Andrade who go for slams and just yeah. had the win of her life, and immediately she's concerned about the not sure. just immediate but maybe long-term well-being of her opponent, Thug Rose Namajunas. But obviously, in this case, the submission is being attempted, so it doesn't even matter the angle on which she brings her down, right? Because Rose is locked in on the Kimura, Andrade is able to slam her at the Sap Minotauro angle, right? So Absolutely. that's scary too, right? So obviously this is a learning lesson, I think, for a lot of fighters. But yeah, Kenny, I, I've always been worried about slams and things like this more than 
you know, knee strikes. And, and I know it's all dangerous and, and I think the rule is fine the way it is. I mean, I don't, I don't think that this is going to affect change and you're going to all of a sudden eliminate slams, but, uh, you know, hopefully this is something the fighters can learn from because, uh, you know, that's as, as concerned as I've been, uh, sitting in that seat for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It was frightening. And again, I, I think there's very few people in the 115 pound women's division that can pull something off like that. Yeah. Andrade was one of them. And and I think when we were talking about this, you know, if Andrade was going to get a finish, it was going to be something like this. She is so powerful and so explosive. And these are the physical tools that should always be respected. You know, Rose Namajunas was absolutely the more technical fighter, but you cannot forget about uh, the, these kind of physical gifts that can absolutely get the finish. So, uh, scary moment there, I think, for, for everybody. I'm glad Rose is okay. Um, it, it's a hard lesson to learn and a hard way to lose your belt there. Uh, but um, uh, what a dramatic fight. I mean, talk about, um, you know, a, a turn of events there. Wow. There's some other bookings as well. Nate Diaz, we didn't talk about this. Nate Diaz booked against, uh, yeah, Anthony Pettis. But what were you going to say, Anthony? Oh, I thought you were, you were jumping in. Uh, so, yeah, what do you think of that fight? Uh, Anthony Pettis on a little bit of an upswing as well. Um, at 170, they're booked, right? Yeah, but what is... Uh... The last few fights of Anthony Pettis. Can you look that up? I know he just knocked out Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Uh, prior to that, I think he lost to uh, our boy Ferguson. They were just talking about that. But what was his form before that? Sorry, I don't have a computer in front of me. Here, I'll do that right now. Pettis. All right, so yeah, here we go. I'll pull up his entire record right now. So he's got the win over Stephen Thompson, lost to Tony Ferguson, a win over Chiesa, lost to Poirier, win over Jim Miller, lost to Max Holloway. I mean, all over the place with his weight. I mean, 145 to 170. Uh, and then uh, win over Oliveira, then three losses in a row. His worst uh, skit of his career to Barbosa, Eddie Alvarez, Rafael Dos Anjos. So, I mean, very hot and cold. Um mm. You know, you know, and it's very. I think I think Nate Diaz opened up as an underdog in this fight. Um, it's it's an interesting fight. This is a really interesting fight. And when you see how hot and cold Anthony Pettis is, um, and then you see how long it's been since Nate. How long has it been since Nate Diaz has been in the yeah. octagon? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. I mean, yeah. Listen, you know, certainly you can't argue with the fact that Anthony Pettis has been hot and cold. You know, that's a fact. He's won some, he's lost some, he lost a few, he won one or two, he lost a few more. And he's gone up and down in weight divisions. Last fight, listen, he knocked out Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. That's a great win for anybody. You know, I mean, knocking him out, Woodley couldn't finish him, Darren Till couldn't finish him. Lots and lots of people have fought uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, and usually he wins. You know, and if he does lose, he doesn't get knocked out. Um, now, Nick Diaz, sorry, Nate Diaz. You know, I mean, this is an interesting situation because I don't know. I mean, when you look at Pettis, he's the better guy. He's the better striker. Um, he's more skilled. He's more polished. More athletic. Uh, more athletic. Yeah. Um, I think this is a dangerous fight for Nate Diaz, especially coming back. He hasn't fought since Conor McGregor, right? 2016. That's three years ago. That's a long time. Now, you know, he's, an, he's a, a pentathlete or whatever he is, triathlons and all that type of stuff. That's all well and good, you know, but that doesn't mean just because someone runs around a fucking track and swims a bunch, they can go in there and fight. Now, of course, he has the mentality, but still, and I say this with respect because I respect both Diaz brothers and what they've accomplished in this sport. You know, time away from the sport can change things. And three years is a lot of fucking time. And Pet is has still been in there the whole time, Lewis. Yeah, that is uh, very true. And whether you're winning or losing, Pettis is training for high level fights. All of his fights. He, Pettis, you know, he's a name at this point. He's such a, a big star that he never is put into an easy fight. He's never put into a you know a fight with a guy that's not already well known or, or highly ranked. Um, so he's always competing for high level fights. A lot of the time, five round fights. Um, and you know, you you've talked about this in the past when you're actually training for a real fight and there's something on the line and they're you know they're you're 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 trying to really legitimately win. It adds a completely other element of motivation so when it's all said and done though i have a difficult time picking against 
Nate Diaz, and just in general, I have a difficult time picking against, against Nate Diaz. I think this is a great matchup. If you're going to look at what you want for Nate Diaz, it's another guy who's not really 170 pounder. He's 155 pounder, um, who is a really, really exciting, fun striker. Nate probably has uh, an advantage on the ground. I don't know if he's going to get there. He doesn't have the wrestling to, to really take down Pettis if Pettis doesn't want it to go there. Um, but I don't know, there's something about the Diaz brothers. They have this it factor where you think they're going to lose these striking matchups, and then they come out and they fucking outbox dudes, and you're like, what just happened there? Did Nate Diaz just knock out Anthony Pettis? Holy shit. Mm, no, 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 you're right. And listen, he definitely has the it factor. He brings it each and every time. There's there's a reason why people love the Diaz brothers. Uh, but one thing, going back to what you said, um, and talking again about the three years away, is that every time you do a training camp, and I'm talking from experience, every time you do a training camp, as a human being and as a mixed martial artist, you've learned a lot of things about yourself. And the more times you do it, you tweak it a little bit. You realize I overtrained in that one. Maybe I don't need to run as much. You realize the next one, oh, you know, my diet wasn't right. I was too weak. I wasn't taking on enough carbohydrates. And then the next training camp, you maybe learn, hold on a minute, I'm doing too much defensive jujitsu. I don't need to do that. I need to be more offensive. And then the next training camp, so on and so forth. You learn about yourself. You learn about your ability to prepare for a fight. And you learn about your skills and what you need to work on. The whole time, Diaz has been away living his good life and good for him and I'm really happy for him. Pettis has been in there fighting the best in the world, losing to a lot of them as well. And when you lose, that's when you truly learn about yourself. So he's been in there, he's been winning some, he's been losing some, but he's been doing it the whole time. So on paper, you've got to lean towards Anthony Pettis here. And I understand that Diaz is as tough as the fuck, uh, sorry, uh, uh, t- <laughs> what? <laughs> Pardon me. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> as tough as they come, but um, you know, as I say, for, for the reasons I just laid out, I got to lean towards Anthony Pettis. Yeah, you're you're probably right. I'm just a big Diaz fan. I, I would love to see them come back. We've talked about it time and time again about w- what a waste of talent I think it is for them to sit out for as long as they do. And I'd love to see Nick come back as well. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I mean, it's a great fight. It's very exciting. There's no doubt about that. Um, both those guys are super exciting, and I'm a fan of both those guys. If you have not already... Hit that subscribe button with its notification bell and leave a comment in the comment box below of what you thought of the video and tune in for more on MMA News Outlet.